Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Brain Cafe. As you can see, there's a bit of a theme going on. Uh, on the menu today are some, what I think are some tasty insights and some things I've cooked up in my lab, and I'll stop the metaphor in a moment. Um, but what I want you to take away from this is that the things that you consume at our cafe are going to affect how your brain functions and how you age. We've just got a taste of that in one direction, and I want to deal with uh, something of the other direction related to overeating and what controls that. So now that you've, you know what's kind of on the menu, let's go shopping at my favorite place here in central Ohio. When you drive up to, I know Kroger's is more popular than my store, but when you do drive up to this, the front in this parking lot, you've all seen signs like this where it says, you know, there's food and drugs, the pharmacy, the grocery. When you go there next time and think about my talk, what I want you to do is see this. I want you to see that, nah, food is drugs, and I want to show you why food acts like drugs. Uh, so the next time you're driving in, I want this image to change for you, all right? So the takeaway point is right here. Drugs are foods. Food should be treated as drugs, and they're both just chemicals. And when I teach my undergraduates at OSU, I tell them I'm going to treat them just like a bag of chemicals, and I want them to view themselves just like a bag of chemicals. And what you add in is going to affect how you think, how you feel, and how you age. So keep this, this motif in mind as we go along. I'll have cups you know, and t-shirts out in the hallway later. Uh, the key thing to recognize, and I always get this question, is how does food affect how I feel? And the answer is in three ways. First, there are short-term effects, such as a cup of coffee. And many of you dabbled in some coffee when you came here this morning. You know the effects tend to be minute, immediate and minutes may last for a few hours. And then there are the intermediate effects of food, and I'll talk about some of those. The amino acids, the nutrients, the vitamins, things that you take today so that you'll feel better tomorrow and next week. And then the long-term things, the things that you do a little bit every day, make these smoke cigarettes, uh, eat a lot of chocolate, or use drugs of some kind, licit or illicit. So I want to touch on those and talk about how they affect how you feel, minute to minute, year to year, and how they affect how you age in the long run, because those two things are intimately connected to each other. Now, to begin, uh, whoops, here we go. Uh, I want to deal with one of three transmitter systems that food interacts with. And all of you have just been manipulating the first one I want to talk about. As you can see from this, this cartoon that was on our students' cafeteria tables when there was a concern they weren't drinking enough coffee. So they put these things out to say, drink coffee. And like any good drug pusher, we were giving coffee away free first. Then when you're addicted, we'll ask you to pay for it. So in this case, the transmitter is acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is enhanced by coffee. That's why I'm showing it to you. Why, what do you use acetylcholine for? Well, acetylcholine in your brain is used, and it allows you to pay attention. It allows you to learn. And in order for you to learn and pay attention, you need to enhance its function. Well, coffee does that. To make acetylcholine in your diet, you need choline, which comes from lecithin, which is in baked goods, and you need sugar for the acetyl groups. So think about this now. The ideal breakfast, the thing that, uh, that drives you every morning, is to Tim Hortons to get a donut and coffee. There's probably nothing you can do better for your brain than donuts and coffee in the morning. So don't listen to these, these people, these dietitians, and think, you know. Um, your brain has a demand. Now, if you think about this, there wouldn't be Tim Hortons and McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts in every corner if we didn't want them to be there. Why do we want them to be there? Because our brain tells us to. And what you're going to see as I go along is that many times, your brain asks you to do things that the rest of your body would prefer it didn't do. And, and you all know what I'm talking about, right? The little angel and the little devil on your head, all right? So acetylcholine is a, is a transmitter that is made from the components of your diet and allows you to pay attention so you can learn and study like this young man in this picture, or it allows you to pay attention to the man who's learning and study like the young woman in this picture. So she's in here for her MRS degree, he's in here for a PhD possibly, but you know what, it happens sometimes. This is an old dated picture as you can tell. The other transmitter uh, that many of us are familiar with is our brain's happiness transmitter, the one that uh, is released and enhanced when we eat uh, or consume chemicals that make us feel euphoric. So all of the things on the list here are euphorogenic compounds. 
So we, we've heard of amphetamine and cocaine and opiates and, and PCP and alcohol and chocolate and coffee. And the reason we love these things is because they induce the release of dopamine. And in the past year, scientists have uncovered the fact that food addicts us in the exact same way that these drugs do, the same mechanisms. You become addicted to coffee, and when it's not in your brain, your brain craves it. You become addicted to nicotine or chocolate. When it's not there, your brain craves it. Now, so that's why when you look at people who've eaten a lot of fat, they're happy. So this is an ad by the Lard Council, and notice the motif again. Chemicals, lard is a chemical that we call a food that is in fact a drug because it releases dopamine and so does amphetamine and cocaine. So lard is cocaine. It's just a lot cheaper. And you can get it at Giant Eagle. All right, so with that in mind, let's go to the other transmitter system. Many of us spend our days manipulating serotonin, possibly intentionally with the, uh, the drugs that we take like Prozac and Zoloft and Effexor, and others manipulate serotonin levels by what we eat. So eating a lot of different foods. But the interesting thing with serotonin, as you've seen, is that serotonin levels make you feel anxious, they make you feel relaxed, they make you feel a little happier. Uh, your mood is influenced significantly. So if you consume foods that affect serotonin, your mood modifies accordingly. And the issue here is balance. You don't want to have too much, as you've seen, or too little. It has to be just in the Goldilocks range, just right enough serotonin. So the things you eat, the nutrients, the chemicals in your diet are manipulating the levels of these transmitters. On the short term, you, you've manipulated the action of acetylcholine so you can learn and pay attention in here. And hopefully you had a donut or some high glycemic food like a bagel or hash browns this morning because you need those things quick, fast nutrients, carbon bond energy to get into your brain. The intermediate things like the amino acids and vitamins that allow you to make these transmitters. And then the long term effects of drugs. What is it that a food or nutrient or drug does to you every day that makes you feel better, healthier as you get older? And what does it do to harm you? Well, that's what I want to get into, the long-term effects. So when you think about the fact that you're just a bag of chemicals, you are essentially chemicals made out of carbon bonds, and we are all carbon bond consumers. We eat these little, these little white balls or carbon bonds, and what you do is you consume them, fats, carbohydrates, or proteins, and zap, you get calories. This is what you all want. This is why you've had your donut this morning. Those vital calories, you woke up after fasting, you need quick calories. And we all do that all through the day. What I want to point out to you is that there's a bit of a problem. There is a problem of debris. You've now used your calories, and you've got a couple of carbon atoms what do you do with them? You can't do anything with them. You consume the energy between them. So you do something really intelligent. You breathe nice air and oxygen into your body, and you go, aha, the oxygen has come to rescue my carbon. And so as we all know, we bind carbon dioxide. There you are. And we go ahead and exhale it, and we've got another problem. There's some leftover oxygen now. Nothing ever balances, all right? So the oxygen is a problem. It's in your body, you need to get rid of it. So why do you have to get rid of it? We all remember in biology in high school that we learned that oxygen is critical for you to live, and if you didn't breathe, you would die, and that's certainly true. But what I want to point out is that the villain in this story, and the villain in your life, is the fact that these things turn to the dark side, and they become really nasty. Oxygen is carried by hemoglobin, yes. The job of hemoglobin is to keep the oxygen levels low enough in your body so it doesn't outright kill you. So oxygen is going to quickly cause injury and inflammation, the little pulsating up there, oxidative stress, and your job then is to protect yourself from it somehow so you eat protective foods. Or you simply don't take in the calories in the first place. Avoid the carbon bonds. That's one way. You just heard of what, an example of that. So protect yourself from the oxygen by eating what? Colorful foods. You've heard this. Vegetables, colorful foods, berries, colorful foods. It's the color that's going to absorb the oxygen that you want to carry it out of your body. That's what an antioxidant is. Protect me from my breathing. If you ever wonder, what is it about my life that makes me get old? It's because you eat and breathe. If you could just stop doing those things, <laughs> you would live a few minutes, right? Okay, so... 
Obviously, that's not a solution. You have to eat. So, but, but there are ways around this. Back to coffee. I can't help but it, it strengthen the, the, the concept in you. Every morning, drink coffee as much as possible because if you happen to be, if you've grown up in a rural environment, you're at risk of Parkinson's, so please, five cups of coffee a day. The antioxidants in coffee, as you can see, the five cups a day decreases your chance of getting Parkinson's by 85%. That's amazing. That's a drug. Coffee is a wonderful chemical drug that some of us view as a food. Now, something you don't often view as a food is marijuana. And that's an issue in many ballots, of course, here in, in Ohio as well. And what you're looking at is a cross-section of a brain from an animal and uh, from some of my laboratory research here at OSU. And we've discovered um, that marijuana is able to reduce inflammation. What you're looking at there, all those blue dots, are inflammatory cells, angry, oxidative, inflammatory cells, chewing up the hippocampus so you can't learn in memory. All you need to do is smoke one puff of marijuana a day, one puff, all right, maybe a patch, maybe a nasal spray, and look what happens. The inflammation goes away. Neurogenesis restarted. These animals are smarter. 35 years I've been looking at chemicals to try and make old animals smarter. You can make any young animal smarter. Who cares? You know, they're six. They're smart. But an old person, it's really tough to reverse things. This is the first compound in the hundreds that I've tested that has ever worked in an old brain. So my recommendation to you is to, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Donuts, coffee, lots and lots of coffee, and just one puff a day. <laughs> and chocolate. Wonderfully dark, rich, colorful antioxidants in chocolate. The great news is that the more chocolate you eat, the longer you live, and the sad news is that it only works in men. Yes. Thank you. My work here is done. Okay, uh, so chocolate has antioxidants in it. It has estrogen alkaloids. And the wonderful thing about chocolate is that men don't have much estrogen, so they benefit from that estrogen. It has marijuana-like compounds in it. It has fats. It releases opiates. If it wasn't already illegal, or legal, it would be made illegal, at least you know, in some states, uh, probably Kentucky. But anyway, uh, what we know is that if you don't want to eat chocolate, and if you're a woman and it's not going to help anyway, then caloric restriction. Just eat a little less. That's the idea. So let's take a look at a couple of friends of mine. This is Owen and Canto. They were involved in a study um, where Owen, as you can see, was allowed to visit McDonald's and eat all he wanted every day. Canto, his brother, no, 30% less. He didn't eat 30% as many calories. You've heard of these kinds of things. In the past 50 years, hundreds of studies have looked at everything from single cell organisms to primates and never humans yet. Um, and what we find is that they're healthier. In the studies I've done, their hair doesn't turn gray, they don't develop cataracts, they're smarter, the inflammation doesn't happen in their brains, so if you, you do eat less food, you don't have to eat so much chocolate, you don't have to smoke so much dope, you don't need to drink so much coffee, keep eating. Um, so what's the recommendation? Just eat less, take in fewer carbon bonds. You won't need as much oxygen. So at the Brain Cafe, we serve breakfast and lunch because if you eat breakfast and lunch, we find that even if you ate the same number of calories and skipped dinner or had minimal dinner, you don't gain as much weight. You don't develop metabolic disorder. There's something about eating late in our biorhythm that's so hazardous. So eat less. Eat about a third less like Canto and eat it early in the day. Breakfast like a king, lunch like a, a prince, dinner like a pauper. You've heard that before. Why? What good is it going to do to you? Well, if we look at the, the human studies, and even studies with animals like rats and monkeys, which is a, this is a compilation of that work. What you can see is that cancers are significantly reduced. So you're not going to live longer, but you're going to be healthier while you are alive. So you, hepatomas, liver cancers, lymphomas, all tumors. And even if you don't get a tumor, your, the function of your organs is better. So kidney function is better. Muscle function doesn't decline. Uh, these animals are stronger. So the idea is that eat less, take in few carbon bonds, need less oxygen, your tissues suffer less. So there is obviously a point that you don't go beyond. Now, the, the sort of extrapolation of this advice would be to 
eat nothing, right? Eat very, very little. I'm not suggesting that. Because you need strength in your bones, right? You need to move around. You want to have the strength to live a life in the quality that you want to live it. So eat enough. Exercise a little bit. And, but just keep in mind, all those carbon bonds you take in to move you around through the world have a cost. And that cost is the burning of oxygen. And the oxygen's presence in your body is harmful. And the consequence of it is that your hair turns gray. You get cataracts. You develop metabolic disorders, kidney failure, muscle failure, all right? So that's the alternative. So when you come to the Brain Cafe, we're going to welcome you in and say, please, come in, have a seat, order nothing. We don't serve large glasses of sodas like New York City doesn't. All right? We will offer you some chocolate and some coffee and some donuts and some marijuana in the back room, but <laughs> please use it wisely. So the idea, the takeaway point, eat wisely, meaning try to eat colorful things to protect you from the oxygen that you must breathe to survive and eat less, take in fewer carbon bonds so that you don't need so much oxygen. Why? Because in the hour that you've been here this morning, 2% of all of the oxygen molecules that you've inhaled have been converted into free radicals, 2% in one hour. That's like almost a, one and a half lungfuls of air, all right? So you've all aged a little bit just sitting here. We know we do that, but when you ask the question, how can I slow it down, this is the answer, all right? Eat less. It's very simple. It'll save you money. You can throw away those tennis shoes, save a lot of money, all right? Thank you very much.